I'm Steve, and my wife is Kate. We have been married for over three years. The first year was really nice. The second was nice, while the third had some flaws. It could appear foolish or infantile. I don't disagree, but I'm not sure how you would react differently. We were in the middle of an argument. Kate and I have had quite a few of those lately, but this one was particularly terrible. I'm not even sure what that was about. Something little, such as clothes or an unpaid bill. Kate has a habit of bringing up unrelated grievances during arguments. Things unrelated to our current dispute. It could be something from years back. For example, when I didn't pick up her sister from a party, or when she had strange thoughts about hitting me. This was one of those occasions where you just couldn't stop talking. Do you know that, Steve? She spoke this in a nasty tone. Nothing makes you happier than hearing your own voice. Even when we are in relationships, you never remain quiet. There was quiet. Kate must have realized from my expression that she had gone too far. I got hurt, so I simply glanced at her. I considered answering, I have no idea. She was concerned by my talking when we were near. It's how I show my love and excitement. But I eventually decided not to say anything. Kate went on to remark that my chatting distracts her during close encounters and turns her off. I was startled. Why hadn't she mentioned this earlier? We'd been married for more than three years and I believed she appreciated my romantic comments. She spoke less than I did in bed, but she always spoke a few words. After a long quiet, I stood up and assured Kate that I would attempt to talk only when it was necessary. Then I exited the room. Update. I was not pleased with my behavior later. All I can say is that I felt extremely hurt. The unexpected argument struck me hard. I assumed that if she wanted silence, she would have it. Our arguments were worsening. Despite our continued love for Kate, we found it difficult to be pleased with one another. There were fewer happy times and more stressful moments and disagreements over trivial matters. A major concern was my employment as a sales representative for a plumbing supply company which required me to travel for around three minutes, four days a month. Kate disliked me being away so long, but she understood this before we married. She also wanted to establish a family, but I refused for another two years. I expected a promotion that would allow me to quit traveling. I really didn't want to have a baby until I could spend all of my time at home. So, those were the major difficulties. Recently, even minor details appear to incite arguments. I couldn't understand why the reservoir of love and goodwill appeared to be nearly empty. Kate remarked something that bothered me. My talking during proximity was the opposite of what turned her on. Did this imply she was enjoying closeness with someone else? Someone who did not speak? It seemed far-fetched until I thought about it further. During my last trip, around ten days ago, I was unable to reach her on the phone twice. The second time, she left her cell phone turned off, when she should have returned from work. The next day she said she went for a beer with friends, which seemed acceptable until I called the house at 10.30 and she was still gone. In addition, three times in the last month, I answered the phone just to have the individual hang up. It's not a major deal, but it has rarely happened before, so I became increasingly skeptical and took action over the next two weeks. Kate presumably assumed she was living with a mute, there will be no small talk, idle conversation, or words until they are absolutely necessary. Instead of asking, can you pass the salt, honey? I stood up and grabbed it myself. In response to her question about the weather for today, I handed her the weather page from the newspaper. If she asked me to make dinner that night, all she got was a yes as she went for work and said goodbye, honey. I smiled at her and waved. It became a game to see how few words I could say to her each day. Kate knew I was furious and hurt, and she understood why. She didn't seem to care at first, but she eventually tried to make amends. She didn't really apologize. That was unusual in our household, but she became far more affectionate. Kisses met me in bed in the morning before leaving for work and again at bedtime. Sometimes she leaned over to hug me when I was reading the paper over coffee in the morning, or she caressed my shoulders while we were watching TV. It was humorous even as my fury subsided, because no one can stay angry for days. I tried not to say much before speaking. I'd question myself if I really needed to say something, and the answer was typically no. I was paying more, watching more, and keeping my thoughts to myself. Kate recommended we make love ten days after our dispute. I couldn't tell if she wanted to or was making up. After dinner, she told me some work-related stories, and I only spoke for six minutes. 
eight words. She rose up and grasped my hand, asking me to leave the dishes until later with a large, warm grin. As she brought me back to the bedroom, she signaled that she needed something else right then. I wondered if our gap had grown as a result of my silence, or if I was mute because we had already drifted so far apart throughout the visit. I hadn't spoken anything as we paired smoothly, easily, and familiarly. I remained utterly silent, feeling strangely chilly and distant. I wasn't even sure whether this was what Kate really wanted, but after that disagreement, I had no intention of saying anything. After we finished, I rolled off of her and she nestled against me, exuding a happy mood despite the lack of vocal communication. We relaxed together for a long, without saying anything. I couldn't tell what it had been like for her. For me, it seemed chilly and empty. It was unclear whether this was due to the silence or the increasing distance between us. Update. After a few more days of minimal conversation, Kate became furious with me. One night at supper, she became frustrated, questioning my quietness and whether I had anything to say. After a minute of reflection, I replied that I believed this was what she desired. She stressed that she wanted a husband who interacts and shares feelings, not someone who looks like a department store mannequin. Privately, I laughed, thinking, good one, Kate. She complained last week that I was talking too much, so I'm trying to change that. Kate accused me of taking the quiet treatment too far, referring to it as the quiet Sam routine. I glanced at her for a moment before speaking. Some of my perplexity was intended to irritate her, but some of it was genuine. I honestly had no idea what she wanted first. I said too much, then too little. How should I know what to do now? She scowled at me, plainly angry, and demanded that I cease and be the guy she married. I regretted my earlier statement that she doesn't talk much. We were arguing. I was upset, so I just flung it at her again. After a moment, I said, All right, Kate, but your words made me think that perhaps I talk too much or without first considering whether I really have anything to say. After a time, I smiled at her and said, In a way, all of this has been beneficial. She smiled warmly back, her wrath gone, and for a brief time I felt the missing intimacy between us. I then broached the subject of making love, sincerely hoping to understand. Instead of responding to my query, I questioned if she meant what she said about not talking during proximity. Kate left the table for the remainder of the evening. She ignored me, which didn't seem fair, despite my sincere attempts to understand her feelings. The next morning brought a more optimistic tone. Kate had backed down from her original outburst, professing a desire for communication. Unfortunately, her attention was fixed on the finish of the conversation, as evidenced by her glares and tight-lipped remarks at breakfast. We suffered a couple more days of limited connection. Ironic this time, since she was giving me the silent treatment. After three to four days, Kate's mood shifted dramatically. She arrived home from work looking extremely angry and went straight to the shower after dinner. She seemed distracted, saying little and frequently losing track of our chat. This was not the angry, quiet treatment anymore. She was obviously preoccupied with something. However, when I repeatedly questioned her if something was wrong, she only mentioned a work issue. I did note, however, that she did not meet my gaze as she said it. Unsure what was bothering her, I decided to wait and see. The next day, I got a call at work. Ernie Manzullo verified my thoughts that Kate had an affair. I thanked him, then left work to go home. Looking through the images, the one surprise was Adam, who had not been my best man but was one of my groomsmen. He had always admired Kate, and I had never viewed him as a threat. I felt chilly and empty. Like the last time Kate and I were in bed together, I sat for a long time thinking about everything and pulled out the photos, which remained untouched from the first time I put them away. Update. When Kate arrived home, she found me sitting on the couch, seemingly inactive. I stayed silent as she greeted me. My expression was intended to appear neutral rather than hostile. Her question concerning my peculiar behavior became more pointed, with a mix of concern and displeasure evident in her angrier tone as she pushed deeper. I remained silent, sensing that something is wrong. Frustration welled up inside her as she begged for an explanation, implying a return to the silent treatment of the past. In answer, I sat up, breaking the tension with a blunt query. I asked her how long she'd been dating him, Kate recoiled in surprise and took a step back, puzzled. 
She took a seat across from me, hoping to grasp my accusation. Her attempts to decipher my expression were unsuccessful. The atmosphere deepened as she denied any involvement with anyone else. Clasping her hands in her lap, she begged me to expose the source of my allegations. Her frustrated plea hinted at a guilty conscience on my part, unyielding. I handed her an envelope carrying a damaging photograph of Kate on Adam's bed. She took a cursory look at it, dropped it in surprise, and recoiled as if it were a menace. Blushing, she retreated to her chair, avoiding eye contact in the face of my continued silence. She decided to change the subject and went to the bedroom. However, I stopped her with the incriminating photograph. She hesitated, unable to avoid my persistent gaze. She eventually met my gaze with a quiet plea. How long? I repeated that her response was to withdraw into herself, arms wrapped securely around her as she shook her head. The stillness lingered, and she eventually appealed to me, demanding that I save her from arguing the subject and declare my desire to depart. In desperation, I rushed to the bedroom to pack. She begged me to wait, promising to reveal everything before relenting. I returned to my seat, observing her as she strained to keep eye contact. The silence was unbearable. She confessed, apologizing and showing regret while pleading with me not to go. I remained sitting, meeting her stare with a firm attitude. She averted her gaze for a minute before gathering the strength to look back at me, tearfully saying that Adam had informed her that I was also participating. Surprised, I refrained from interrogating her and motioned for her to proceed. Kate revealed that she had met Adam at the grocery about a month before. He, being pleasant and courteous, had offered her company in my absence. They arrived at our house with pizza and wine and had a pleasant evening together. Adam's claim that I was also engaging in comparable behaviors misled me. Near the end, he began to appear anxious and disturbed. Kate questioned him about it. He claimed I was unfaithful. He did an excellent job of acting, appearing hesitant with his head hanging, avoiding eye contact with me. According to him... You and he had a conversation a few of weeks ago in which you confessed about a girl you were engaged with on your vacations. He gave persuasive information about her appearance, where you met, and how well you stated she was in bed. I began crying, and Adam consoled me by expressing his respect for my attractiveness and handsomeness. He couldn't understand how a man could cheat on me and promise to do whatever to make me feel better. We eventually ended up in bed together, and I only discovered yesterday that the entire tale was bogus. I waited, expressionless. She continued, her face more sad than before. I found myself in his apartment after sharing a romantic moment with a smug look. He mentioned that without Steve's participation with Julia, we would not have understood how well we connect. I bring up the problem of inconsistency, telling him that during our first talk regarding your lover, he mentioned the name Joanne. He couldn't recollect any information about her appearance or how you met. Frustrated, I screamed for him to tell me the truth. Did you actually cheat on me? He smiled, confessing that it was all a story to get into my trousers. Kate's face went red with rage. I stood up, threw on my clothes, and berated him for making a mockery of myself. He laid there, smirking, unapologetic, or sorry about his actions. I couldn't believe what I'd accomplished. And then she couldn't speak. Sobbing with her face in her hands and her body heaving, the need to console Kate was replaced with a frigid emptiness. Was she really so naive, or had our relationship degenerated to the point that she believed even the most ludicrous stories? Then there was my wrath towards Adam. Kate wailed while I, a 15-year acquaintance, sat silent. After about five minutes, I got up. Kate looked at me with terror. I removed her cell phone from her purse, placed it in my pocket, and then went to the bedroom and kitchen, unplugging the phones and placing them in a bag under my arm before leaving. I returned Kate's gaze and expressed my intention to return. I told her not to go and to avoid engaging in talks with anyone. Despite my calm tone, she appeared afraid and nodded in agreement with my orders. Update. On the trip to Adam's, I concentrated on managing my breathing to appear calm and nice. When Adam opened his door, he appeared surprised and nervous. Without hesitation, I invited him for a few of beers and suggested we watch the Phillies. Kate was attending a meeting. Despite his rigorous observation of me, he maintained a cordial tone and accepted my proposal. 
We sat in his living room, conversing amicably as the game played in the background, keeping things light. I noticed Adam progressively relaxing, assuming it was a casual visit. However, I was unsure about the issue. It took more than an hour to shift the topic toward intimacy. I asked about the females he was dating, which made him nervous, but my encouraging look inspired him to tell me about a female at work who he'd been dating casually. I recounted a chatty college girlfriend, and Adam took the bait, agreeing that actions speak louder than words in romantic situations. Laughing, he boasted about revealing numerous girls' wants, expressing satisfaction and leaning in. I surprised him by asking about Kate's preferences. After a moment of disbelief, he agreed to remain silent, and I reassured him with a grin. He stayed mute, staring at me anxiously and showing my skepticism. I confronted him for violating our friendship and fooling my wife by having an affair with her while downplaying it. He said it wasn't a big thing, claiming she was just a woman. He trailed off, uncertainly, glancing at my face, staring at him in amazement. I wondered how I had ever been friends with him, insisting that things were better now. I insisted that he tell me everything about his dishonest game with Kate, after he had already spoken to her. I warned that lying would not work, wide-eyed and really terrified. Adam nodded at me, indicating his ready to speak. He repeated the story which closely matched what Kate had described. He had always found her attractive and had been flirting with her for months any time he saw her. He was single. One week he ran into her at the grocery and first thought he could entice her. He made up a tale about my romance. When it became clear that she would not cheat on me, he intentionally enraged her and made her feel terrible for herself, making it easy to get her into bed. They met approximately five more times, always at his place. The first encounter was not pleasant because she was unhappy over my claimed infidelity. She cried. However, the ensuing times were excellent, exactly what he said when he observed my dissatisfaction. He instantly stopped speaking. I'd cut his hair close to the roots by then, and I enjoyed seeing him wearing hats for weeks. I coldly questioned whether it was over. After a little pause, he admitted it and explained how she found out about the falsified story. I can't recall the name of the fictitious female I was dating. She became angry and fled. I was prepared to depart feeling empty. I could have asked for more information, but I decided not to. I informed Adam that our friendship was terminated and warned him against revenge. We agreed not to involve the police. He nodded, appearing humiliated rather than angry and asked to be freed, smiling. I promised him that I would leave the apartment door open, allowing him to depart in approximately an hour. I walked away without looking back. When I returned, Kate was sitting on the couch in her bathrobe, her wet hair signaling recent sorrow. I strolled around the apartment, adjusting the phones. She sat across from her, looking terrified and unhappy. We exchanged eyes, but I remained silent. Eventually, she asked about my behavior. I detailed my chat with Adam, assuring her that I had not resorted to violence and expressing pessimism that I would hear from him any time soon. Although she admitted that she nearly wished I had challenged him physically, she was aware of the potential ramifications. Troubled, she attempted to move on, recognizing her folly and asking for pardon. I looked at her for a long time before responding. Our practice of saying little to one another is becoming ingrained. I do not know, I eventually responded and that was an honest admission. Tears welled up in her eyes as she started crying. Kate entered the kitchen the next morning, delighted with the food, and coffee was on the table. Her excitement faded immediately as she noticed the two enormous luggage near the door. Distraught, she questioned my departure and begged me not to leave. Instead of leaving without speaking, I offered her a cup of coffee and encouraged her to sit across from me. Kate, it is over, I declared. I admitted. Unsure of what had happened or why, but highlighted that our relationship had worsened despite our initial compatibility. I emphasized a year of impatience, impulsiveness, and continual conflict. I pointed out that her decision to trust Adam's dubious claim about my infidelity, as well as her following behaviors, marked a shift from the woman I had married. I speculated that she must have been on the verge of straying for our relationship to reach this point. Pausing. I waited for her response, but she cried quietly, covering her face in her hands as I stopped speaking. She glanced up at me, begging. I gave her the opportunity to speak and prove me incorrect. 
outline a path to rekindle our love. Unfortunately, she remained silent, only looking at me and crying. I went to the door. I said her farewell as I gathered up my suitcases and left. Here is the next story. Attending my wife's office party had its highs and lows. On the one hand, I liked the opportunity to unleash the full force of my challenger on the open road. However, the faster I spent, the sooner I reached my feared destination. The celebration was scheduled for the Company Lodge, which is reachable via a beautiful 20-mile stretch of road free of stop signs and traffic lights. It was just me and my Dodge speeding towards the gathering with no pit stops in sight. Candy and I had grown apart ever since our daughters married. I had thought that our link would strengthen, but it seemed destined to fray. Despite my reservations, Candy insisted that I accompany her this time. Though she had previously attended such gatherings alone, I, unlike her, was not a big drinker or social butterfly. Over the last year, I'd had suspicions about her cheating. Nonetheless, I found myself indifferent. Perhaps this indifference was a symptom of our deteriorating relationship, as I silently sought an escape strategy from our unhappy marriage, a way to cut ties with a fading affair. I must admit that I probably played a factor in my wife's decision to choose a different route. I've always been a bit of an outlier, a strange kind of minimalist. Growing up in a financially constrained family meant that my siblings and I did not have the traditional childhood extravagances, such as bikes, toys, or expensive electronics. It was similar to an Amish lifestyle, minus the religious doctrine. While I understood the workings of the conventional world, I couldn't completely comply to its rules. I prioritized avoiding debt, paying payments on time, and saving for the future. Living comfortably as a minimalist does not need devotion, but it does necessitate moderation. A few indulgences here and there assist to give the outer world the impression that everything is normal. Marriage and family were my biggest indulgences. Finding a companion who could endure my eccentricities and accept my foibles was no easy task. Candy, who came from a similar background to myself, was used to living on a tight budget. Although not as thrilled as I was, she was able to tolerate it. However, with time, she seemed to lean toward normalcy, becoming less thrifty and more conventional, especially once our girls arrived, in order to avoid being perceived as unusual. We chose a modest, practical home and upgraded our clothes. Candy even began dabbling in hairstyling and makeup to hone her grooming talents. We purchased two smartphone models from the previous year to align with societal expectations. As our daughters grew older, Candy chose to enter the workforce, taking a minimum wage office job because transportation was vital. We purchased a tiny Honda Civic for her that mirrored my own automobile. Her wages barely covered her transportation bills, lunches, and new outfit needs. It evened out, and I was pleased with it. My name is Michael Johnson, which is about as commonplace a name as it gets. I tirelessly work as a parts puller for a local company that specializes in industrial compressors. Though the task is boring, I find it satisfying. Despite being offered promotions, I rejected without telling Candy. I was content with my existing wage position, so my secret indulgence was smart retirement planning. Whenever feasible, I surreptitiously acquired one ounce of crude, amassing over 30 in my basement safe with plans to continue. My final indulgence was a 1970 Dodge Challenger left to me by my late brother Travis, who was tragically killed while working on an offshore oil platform. Even though I was solely responsible for its upkeep, the insurance costs were astronomical. Candy thrived at Gilbert Industrial, earning regular raises and promotions. Initially, she gladly discussed details about her career, then her chats about work dwindled. I suspected something was wrong, but I couldn't pinpoint it tonight. I'm hoping to obtain insight into the problem. The workplace event resembled a weekend-long retreat. I felt out of place, reluctantly attending. Despite having met all of her associates, I had no feelings for any of them. Exiting the freeway near Holbrook, I grabbed the opportunity to unleash the challenger's full force. She answered with vigor, as expected. Candy, on the other hand, appeared to be worried with the speed. Despite her agony, she remained silent. Yes, I did exceed the speed limit. No, I was not concerned by it. Mike, what is the rush? We have plenty of time. Maybe reduce the throttle a little, Candy urged. I'm not rushing to come. I did not want to go in the first place. I am simply giving the engine a thorough workout. It needs it now and then. I explained. Please do not damper the mood. This weekend is critical for my job. 
Mrs. Griffin also highlighted how important her presence is. She stated that Lois Griffin, the wife of the company's president, Oscar Griffin, came from a family of old money and business traditions. Why? I pressed. What do you mean? She countered. Why is my attendance so important at this event? I didn't get it. I underlined, Mike, that understanding the dynamics of my new role in the organization is critical for effective support, she clarified. I am still not following. I confessed. My new position presents distinct challenges. Roy proposed that you be progressively introduced to them so that you may completely understand and support me. It may seem daunting at first, but she is confident you will understand it soon, she stated. I've always got your back. What's the difference now? I inquired. My new role requires more from both of us. Voice feels that progressive exposure will help you navigate it with me, she reasoned as we approached the launch. My heart was racing with eagerness. Candy's implicit message was clear. This was going to be an exciting weekend. When Candy arrived, she quickly entered the launch, leaving me to handle the bags. I couldn't get over the feeling of being put in my place. Hey, Mr. Johnson, you have some nice wheels? Is this a 70 or 71? Wiley Bailey, the company's jack-of-all-trades, welcomed me. Hello, Wiley. 70? I replied cheerfully and introduced myself to his wife, Margaret. They were seated on the front porch, appearing to avoid the mob inside. Scanning the parking lot, I spotted maybe 16 automobiles and one weathered truck at the far end. For the next several minutes, our talk focused on the Challenger. Why are you both out here? Shouldn't you be indoors like everyone else? I inquired. This is not our scene, Mr. Johnson. We had hoped to go early, but Mrs. Griffin insisted we stay. We came up early today to help with the setup. Caterers had packed up around an hour ago, while he explained in vague terms. Could you please elaborate on what is happening? I pressed some. Something isn't right, but I can't quite pinpoint it. I hate to say it, but I think it has something to do with your wife, he murmured. Are you planning on staying for the entire weekend? I asked. Not. That is why I parked my pickup to the side. He responded with an easy departure option, adding to the mystery's appeal. I best get these luggage up to our room. Give me a heads up before leaving. All right, I requested. Sure thing, Mr. Johnson. Keep an eye on your back. Do not act rashly, while they warned. Thankfully, there were just a few little bags to carry into the launch. Mrs. Griffin gave me a smile and a wave. Candy, clearly impatient, waited at the top of the stairs. Finally, Mike, we have a few hours before the evening function. Refresh up and dress nicely. She commanded, Tonight will be special, and I want everything to be perfect. If that's okay, I guess I'll go for a walk about the property to relax for a while. I'll be back on time. I proposed as I departed the room, and I couldn't help but notice Candy's lips smirking. The intrigue grew with each passing second. The fresh air provided a lovely touch to my stroll as I counted the cars. My estimate matched 16 automobiles. The majority of them were Mercedes with a few Jaguars and a lone Max. Four of them had out-of-state plates. It puzzled me how my wife, in her current job, could fit in with such affluent circles. We were clearly out of our league, and as I watched Wally and Margaret load their things into the truck, I approached to talk. It appears that Mrs. Griffin gave you permission to leave, I commented. Not precisely. We're leaving quietly while he responds. I'm feeling a little uneasy here, Mr. Johnson. Wally proposed that we stay, but I convinced him otherwise. Margaret joined in. I would like it if you could stay until after the evening buffet. I'm feeling a little nervous, and your company would be reassuring. Margaret, do you agree that two heads are better than one? I made a weak joke, which elicited a shy smile from her. I believe we can handle it. In addition, the buffet line includes crab and oysters, Wally added, indicating his gastronomic preferences. I had a hunch I would like Wally's company. I followed my wife's insistence on dressing up for the event. Just before we arrived at the buffet, our hostess hooked her arm with mine and led me to a little nook. We're thrilled you've chosen to join us tonight to support Candy. This is a pivotal moment in her career, and your continuous support is critical. Mrs. Griffin enthusiastically emphasized that the pay and benefits package she is receiving are fairly substantial, and she is confident that you will be happy. Excuse my curiosity, but what is the position we're discussing? Candy has proven elusive any time I've inquired. I inquired tonight, but was dismissed with promises of explanations. No need to worry, Michael. 
I guess she just wants to surprise you, Mrs. Griffin reassured. You haven't fully answered my question, I persisted. Well, there is no formal title. Mrs. Griffin revealed that she's taking on the role of personal assistant. I see. Well, the buffet seems tempting. Thank you for your clarification, Mrs. Griffin, I replied. Voice. Please call me Lois, she requested kindly. I spent the next hour enjoying the food while candy mingled with the powerful visitors. This gave Wally, Margaret, and me some valuable time together, as we were wrapping up. Mrs. Griffin approached Michael. Candy reported that you had brought your sleek little automobile tonight. Would you mind doing a short booze run for us? She asked. I nodded, smiling. Of course, Lois. What do you need? Three cases of wine are waiting at the ABC store in Holbrook. They're already paid for, so it should be a simple pickup. If any problems happen, please call me. And don't forget your phone, she said. I'll let Candy know and leave right immediately. I comforted her as Mrs. Griffin moved away, and I caught Wally's eye. Meet me outside in five, I whispered. Candy simply smiled when I told her about Mrs. Griffin's request, delivering a friendly reminder. Do not forget your phone. It struck me as odd that she and Mrs. Griffin emphasized the same detail. Wally, I need a favor, I said, tossing the keys to the challenger. Are you serious? His eyes brightened up. Take it down to Holbrook and pick up those three cases of wine from the ABC store for Mrs. Griffin. If you catch my drift, I believe there may be a snag that causes delays, I explained. Wally smiled knowingly and nodded in agreement. Here is my phone. Just leave it on the dashboard. If it rains, ignore it and do not turn it off. Clear. I handed him the phone. How long should we be gone? While they inquired, at least two hours. And make sure you fill up the petrol tank before traveling back to the resort. Enjoy the drive, I said. The evening air had a tiny chill, but I was happy for the comfy jacket I throng on. Now all that was left to do was wait and observe from various vantage points on the back porch. I could catch glimpses of the lodge's interior. I wished I'd brought a thermos of coffee, but that level of foresight escaped me, finding a quiet position where I could observe without being observed. I settled in. Candy seemed to command the center of attention, yet I still couldn't discern the rationale for it. She was radiant, laughing and chatting with guests as if she were a Hollywood celebrity. Twenty minutes later, I spotted Mrs. Griffin and Candy inspecting Candy's cell phone. It was evident what they were up to monitoring my whereabouts. Meanwhile, thanks to Wally, I was well on my way to Holbrook. Their smiles and Mrs. Griffin's raised hand hinted at some form of approval from the room though I couldn't quite make out the details of their conversation over the distance. It almost looked as though there was a quiet collective nod of agreement among the guests, a subtle type of applause. Oscar Griffin approached, clasping Candy's hand. Together, they ascended the main staircase, their hands raised in a victorious gesture, accompanied by laughter. The room erupted in cheers as they made their way up the stairs with the challenger, still about an hour and a half away. I resolved to make the most of my time, my trusty buck pocket knife, a cherished gift for my daughters a decade ago, was always at my side, made of sturdy steel, and maintained a keen edge, surveying my surroundings. I decided to start with the cars nearest to the launch, taking care to work meticulously. There was no need to rush. Each valve stem was carefully removed and stowed away in my jacket pocket. Sixteen cars, sixty-four valve stems in total. With nearly an hour left, I pondered how to occupy myself, for cars remained locked, but the others were accessible. Retrieving the registration slips proved an easy task, whether tucked into visors or stowed in glove compartments. Though unsure of their future use, I deemed them worth keeping. With thirty minutes remaining until Wally's return, I turned my attention to the spare tires since I had access to the cars. The trunks were open to me as well. Within twenty minutes, ten more valve stems were added to my collection. Surprisingly, two cars lacked spare tires altogether. I'll admit my actions were petty and immature, but they provided a small sense of satisfaction. I've never been one for confrontation, preferring instead to operate in the realm of subtle and underhanded tactics. I didn't feel the need to assert my masculinity or portray myself as a hero, but the alpha males take on that role. Twenty minutes later, the challenger returned with Wally and Margaret, both seemingly pleased with the excursion. As anticipated, 
There was indeed a delay at the ABC store and appeared to be pre-planned. Not a single call came through to my cell phone during their absence. I switched it off and removed the sound card. They were eager to depart, and I bid them farewell, strongly advising Wally to seek alternative employment as soon as possible. I suspected the cases of wine in the truck were quite valuable, to avoid any accusations of theft. I promptly placed all three cases on the lodge's front porch. The journey home was tranquil. There wasn't much of importance left at the house, just a few personal documents, my laptop and my cruiser. Initially, I had considered setting the house ablaze before departing, but I didn't want tomato rice candy in any way. Within two hours, I was back on the road. There was no need for a farewell note or leaving behind my wedding ring. Let her puzzle it out on her own. With no particular destination in mind and no sense of urgency, I embarked on a two-day drive by Monday morning. I made the decision to call into work and tender my resignation. I requested that my final paycheck be forwarded to my parents' house in Carlisle. Needless to say, my abrupt departure didn't sit well with my employer, but I offered no explanation beyond a simple apology. A reliable breakfast at Waffle House was always a comforting constant. While perusing a local merchandiser paper over my meal, I stumbled upon an intriguing help-wanted ad for a nearby supermarket. They were seeking someone to stock shelves from 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. after breakfast. I decided to check out the market, located in a quaint older section of Chattanooga. Driving around the neighborhood for the next hour, I admired the charm of the older craftsman cottages and spotted a few mobile homes scattered about while a small trailer could suffice. I was hopeful for something a bit more substantial. Fortuitously, I came across a sign advertising a garage apartment for rent. Though the garage wasn't included, I negotiated an additional $1.50 a month for access. The apartment itself was modest, a one-bedroom unit with a half-bath. Furnishings included a bed, dresser, table, and chairs. The rent was reasonable in the location ideal, so I decided to seize the opportunity. I could address the lack of a full bath later. At least I now had a home for the challenger. The job situation at the supermarket was unique. While they had plenty of applicants, they were hesitant to leave just anyone alone in the store overnight. I laid out my circumstances to the owner without sugarcoating anything. What sealed the deal was my willingness to work off the books without benefits and at a dollar less than their preferred rate. Surprisingly, they didn't even ask for my social security number. It was a win-win situation. I was happy and they were satisfied. Plus, the supermarket was conveniently just a ten-minute walk from my new apartment. The remainder of the day was spent settling into my new abode. The landlord kindly provided me with the access code to his internet, which I appreciated. A brief visit to the local Goodwill yielded some kitchen essentials and a small microwave, along with linens and cleaning supplies. That evening, I made the decision to cancel my life insurance policies, though I opted to leave banking and credit card matters untouched. After all, what harm could she really do with both of our daughters now married? My departure felt slightly less burdensome, though we hadn't yet welcomed grandchildren. I suspected it wouldn't be too long. I reached out to my daughter, Batty, to reassure her of my well-being, while she knew I had left. Candy hadn't divulged any further details. Batty assured me she'd keep her sister Alice informed, deleting all calls from my wife. I powered off my phone once more, feeling the grime of the day. A shower sounded heavenly. Perhaps tomorrow would be the date for that. Not everything fell seamlessly into place. Securing a safe location for my gold became a priority. While the value of my stash may not have been substantial in the grand scheme, its significance to me was paramount. In a somewhat peculiar twist, I ended up securing a safety deposit box in Huntsville, Alabama, hoping to obscure any connection to Chattanooga. My hopes of remaining incognito were dashed when it became apparent that the two locations were indeed linked. Nevertheless, I found solace in the notion that I had made an effort. Despite the nearly two-hour drive, I didn't mind the trip. Though the garage door at the apartment provided some security, I took extra precautions by installing a new house in a heavy-duty lock. My cherished vehicle needed protection after all. Adjusting to my new job was relatively swift. Initially, I had a colleague working alongside me for the first three nights, but soon found myself flying solo tasks in the produce and meat departments were minimal. But the frozen food section posed its challenges.
However, after a couple of weeks, I had everything under control to address my showering needs. I opted for a Planet Fitness membership, which set me back $1.20 initially and $1.10 a month thereafter. The downside? They required a credit card number. This necessitated another trip to Huntsville to obtain a credit card for my new bank. It was becoming apparent just how difficult it was to completely vanish off the grid. Clearly, some adjustments were in order. Uncertain of the extent Candy may go to in her hunt for me, if at all. I vowed to cross that bridge when I came to it. Before long, I had my evening ritual down to a science. Clocking in at 10 p.m. and wrapping up at 6 a.m., I'd make the 20-minute jog or 30-minute stroll over to Planet Fitness. Initially, my subscription was solely for the shower facilities, but gradually I found myself leaning towards the other gym equipment. By the end of the first month, I was clocking about two hours of exercise daily. Not only did I feel physically better, but I also observed a minor reduction in weight. While I never considered myself overweight, removing some flab was a wonderful benefit. It was comforting to settle back into a routine, I grew acclimated to my new job and found a sense of contentment in its routine. Oddly, finding a certain fascination in its repeated character, it's tough to express, but perhaps you can get what I mean. I accomplished my job efficiently, and in return they provided me the space to work autonomously. Planet Fitness proved to be a fantastic pick. Swiftly, I recognized which exercises I enjoyed and which ones I desired to avoid. Heavyweights held no appeal for me, and as I drawn to the gym regularly, the treadmills lost their attractiveness. I began each session with the Planet Fitness Circuit Workout, a vigorous 30-minute regimen. Following that, I spent 20 minutes on the C2 rowing machine, another 20 on the stair stepper, and finally 20 minutes on an upright bike. I never bothered with the television, but I did get a used desktop computer with a nice monitor, most evenings, my enjoyment consisted of viewing YouTube videos, while I did not spend much time cooking. With my irregular working hours, I observed my eating habits gradually shifting toward a quasi-keto diet. After three months, I unwittingly incorporated intermittent fasting into my regimen, which resulted in an enhanced sense of well-being and weight loss. I determined that it was time to reconnect with my daughters. This time, I called Alex's number. Hello, Alice. It's your father. Okay, it's about time. We have all been anxious about you. Are you okay? Yes, I am doing fantastic. Do not worry about me. I've always been capable of taking care of myself. I'm phoning to see how your mother is doing. Mom is doing good. She received a promotion at work and seemed to be enjoying her career. But she's quite angry with you. She claimed you abandoned her during her promotion celebration and fled home like a hurt child. They were her exact words. She believes you are jealous of her success. I'm sorry, but I can't add anything to it until she is ready. To tell the truth, that is all I have. She indicated that things are a little tight financially without your income, but she believes she can handle it given her race. I'm delighted to hear that she's doing well. Has she told you anything about her new job? Just that she's earning more money and traveling more. I fell silent. After a little pause, Alice resumed. Will you be home for Christmas? I do not think so. I will attempt to send something for you and Patty. Dad, we don't need or want anything. We would rather have you here. Sorry for that. I have to go now. Tell Patty I said hi. Bye. I found myself in a funk. It appeared that my girls did not understand the complexities of the matter and placed the blame solely on my shoulders. While I wasn't delighted with being portrayed as the villain, I didn't feel compelled to defend myself. It became evident that my wife had no remorse, and I couldn't help but feel spiteful. According to my daughter's report, Candy was doing well without me, which made me wonder why she wanted me back home. I drowned my sorrows with a case of black and tan over the weekend, and I noticed a progressive increase in my beer consumption. However, as the weeks went, things began to improve. I excelled at my career and obtained an unexpected promotion with complete control over my tasks. I quickly streamlined and improved the inventory replenishment mechanism. My weekly reports were extremely helpful to the organization, directing inventory levels and restocking intervals. Although the store's computer system accomplished these chores automatically, my manual contribution was greatly appreciated. My living environment was ideal for me and within my budget. I lost some weight and began to build muscle, catching a peak of a six-pack in the right lighting, choosing to let my face hair grow. 
I now had a full head of hair long enough to tie back in a small ponytail. My entire demeanor appeared to have changed, emanating a sudden feeling of confidence and possibly even a trace of intimidation. My gym sessions became more manageable, and I was able to stretch out for longer periods of time. Surprisingly, I began making new acquaintances at the gym. I was cautious, especially around the female gym visitors, to avoid any potential inappropriate behavior with the guys. It was all playful banter and taunting. We liked to poke fun at one another on a daily basis. Despite this companionship, an odd bond evolved. Everyone called her Judy, not very sociable. She hardly spoke with anyone other than me. Each morning, she began an intensive fitness regimen, foregoing the niceties of a yoga-style routine. She appeared to be in her mid-forties and tough-looking. She was always dressed in sweatpants and a hoodie, in stark contrast to the other women who showed off their curves in tight, revealing outfits. I received my fair share of teasing for being the only male she interacted with at the gym. While I did not aggressively seek her companionship, I did not reject her approaches in any way. I'll admit that her attention was flattering, yet, despite several months passing without touch with either my girls or my wife, I couldn't bring myself to call out. Instead, I focused my efforts on growing my crude urine collection over several trips to Huntsville. However, a shift in the wind was on the way. Michael, may I have a word with you? Judy's use of my entire name took me off guard. She was the only person who called me Michael instead of Mike. It was unexpected to say the least. Of course, Judy, what is on your mind? How may I serve you? I have something to discuss with you. We found a bench inside. We've settled in. I have a work event on Friday evening and need an escort. I'll cover all expenditures and arrange transportation, since I realized you don't drive. If necessary, I can compensate you. Judy picked up on my hesitation right away. Did I say something wrong? I apologize if I did. Not at all. It's simply that my life is a little complicated. If you can overlook these, I'd be delighted to assist. Okay? What are the issues? First of all, I am married. I see. You never mentioned a wife. I think that alters things. Not necessarily. I wanted to be open with you. I haven't seen or spoken with my wife in almost nine months. I'm not sure if we are still married. Have you ever filed for divorce or separation? No, I have not. All right. What else? I don't have any proper apparel, including suits, coats, dress shirts, and formal shoes. I don't own any of that since I have no use for it. That is not an issue. I can take care of it. That is why I'm requesting a week in advance. I work nights, but I believe I can take the evening off without trouble. I am delighted to hear that. What more do you want me to shave or do? Michael, I like your beard and hair, although you appear a little disheveled. Would you mind if my stylist gave you a once-over on Friday afternoon? A stylist? I grumbled and nodded in agreement. And thus began my relationship with Judy, also known as Judy Walker, attorney at law. On Tuesday, I found myself at Joe's Bank, which is a step up from my typical haunts. Thanks to Judy's prior arrangement, I left with two pairs of slacks, two sport coats, a couple of shirts, a few ties, and two turtleneck shirts, something I've always fancied. Judy had taken care of the payments. On my way home, I stopped by to get a new pair of respectable shoes and some new undergarments to fit my recent weight decrease, choosing moccasin-style shoes. I made sure they were still dressed appropriately for the occasion. On Friday, my visit to the stylist went perfectly. The hairdresser was friendly and skilled, leaving me with a well-trimmed beard and changing my ponytail into a short, modified mullet. I couldn't specify the precise style, but it was longer in the back, which he promised me would be easier to manage. I was pretty satisfied with the stylist's results. I didn't say anything about Judy, save that I was a lucky guy. Judy arrived on time at 6 p.m., beeping from her Lexus outside my flat, a dramatic contrast to the surrounding neighborhood, wearing a gray jacket and matching turtleneck. I thought I looked fairly dapper, but I had no genuine point of reference. I was thankful Judy was driving because I was unfamiliar with the sea's routes. Judy, before we go inside, could you just clarify what my job is tonight? The first hour will likely be spent socializing. You do not have to go into that scene. The majority of the attendees will be pretentious snobs that you'd rather avoid. Just stay close to me and keep the crepes at bay. Be subtle, but do not allow anyone to push you aside. Make sure I always have a drink on hand, whether it's ginger ale or mineral water. Maintain a cheerful and affable demeanor and do not lose your calm under any circumstances. 
Essentially, you are my arm candy. Let them believe we are a couple. I've never thought of myself that way. I don't have much experience with this type of thing. Do you believe you can manage it? Absolutely. Is there some food? After approximately an hour, we'll be fed a $1.500 plate of rubber chicken and listen to some remarks. Following then, there will be additional socialization. By the way, you look terrific. I realized I hadn't complimented her on her clothes or hair. I really felt out of my depth. The first half of the evening went exactly as Judy had described. Surprisingly, I found my role to be less intimidating than anticipated. The room was alive with single, well-dressed men flashing their costly suits and watches. Judy, appearing as lovely as ever, drew a lot of attention from these suitors, most of whom were aware she was single. They approached her cautiously to test the waters, channeling my inner Charles Bronson. I gave them a stern look, which surprisingly discouraged them. Every time I left Judy's side to refill her drink, another opportunist stepped in. Some even brought her drinks, which she surreptitiously handed to me for disposal. Judy shot a couple glances at me, her smile uncertain. Finally, it was time to sit down. Suddenly, 300 chicken meals came out of thin air. It was a poor excuse for a supper. I'm not usually a picky eater, but this was poor. With each taste, I couldn't stop thinking about the dollar five hundred price tag. Judy leaned forward, asking, Michael, do you want to leave this joint? trying to add a cheap accent? It fell flat. I didn't respond. Instead, I got up from my seat, took Judy's hand, and we slipped out discreetly. I doubt anyone noticed as we approached the parking garage. Judy kicked off her shoes and tossed the Lexus keys to me. Get us some actual food. Michael, she mentioned. Twenty minutes later, we were at Hillbilly Willie's, savoring a full rack, each accompanied by a lengthy neck. Judy did not shy away from the Tabasco, and we both ignored the side of fries in favor of the highly anticipated bibs instead. During our feast, I couldn't help but notice an unusual. Judy's evening gown had long sleeves, which was unusual among the other women's clothes, which typically featured short sleeves or none at all. Nonetheless, she stayed barefoot, obviously unconcerned by her unorthodox choice. As we dined, everything reverted to normal. My evening with Judy was good, but it lacked any sense of closeness. Our dynamic at the gym remained consistent, with friendly joking and mutual encouragement. Judy contacted my company again three weeks later for another party that required an escort. I easily agreed, feeling forced to explain the circumstances to my supervisor. We found it quite humorous, understanding the circumstances. He assured me that requesting permission for time off was unnecessary. A short note should suffice. Essentially, he left me to handle my own schedule appropriately. Judy's tough daily exercise program was obvious. Despite being fully dressed, she maintained a rapid heart rate and perspired abundantly. While most female gym goers wore sports bras and shorts, Judy preferred sweaters and long pants. However, it struck me as peculiar. I chose not to bring up the matter. Our second outing resembled the first, minus the meal, and with a rise in libations, with additional drinks came an influx of unwanted attention from eager suitors. Each new arrival seemed to bring Judy another cocktail, keeping me occupied as I discreetly disposed of the unwanted drinks. However, one very persistent person tried my patience. I took him aside and gave him a whispered warning that if he made another move toward my alleged fiancé, he would face consequences. After that, he and several of the other unpleasant guests disappeared for the rest of the night. I hadn't realized how intimidating I could be. Following the event, we went for sushi, eating a whopping dollar forty worth of sashimi. Despite the lack of romantic engagement, it was another pleasant, platonic evening. Two days later, Judy caught me off unprepared during my rowing exercise. Why didn't you tell me we were engaged? I felt a little embarrassed yesterday when some of my co-workers inquired about it without waiting for an answer. She smiled and continued her workout. I decided to ask my daughter, Betty, for an update. She added that Candy had avoided both her and Alice. All Batting knew was that Candy's schedule required frequent travel and that visitors had become commonplace in the house. When I asked if her mother had initiated divorce procedures, Patty said she had no idea. It had been weeks since they'd heard from Candy or Alice. With each empty bottle, I became obsessed by anger for reasons I couldn't fully understand. 
My frustration only grew the next morning, spurred by my irritation. I went to the post office and delivered 74 valve stems to Oscar Griffin at Gilbert Industries in a flat-rate box. I included a small message, Thank you for an unforgettable evening. Even though it had been almost a year after the party, I was confident he would remember the incident. I skipped the gym that day due to a hangover from my excessive drinking session. I couldn't bear the thought of exercising with a pounding headache. The next day, Judy interrogated me about my conduct, causing me to promise her an explanation at our next supper. True to my word, she picked me up at 6 p.m. that evening and took me to Ruth's Chris Steakhouse, an upmarket restaurant I had never visited before. I made an attempt to dress correctly for the event. Judy listened intently during the lunch and avoided giving judgment. I got back to my flat in time for my job shift. I am grateful for her understanding. Judy asked me at the gym the next day if I knew any of the people who had been at the lodge the night of the party. When I explained that I had the names and addresses of everyone in attendance, she seemed to react. After our workout, she stopped by my flat, and I handed her an envelope containing 12 automobile registrations. She thanked me and kissed my cheek before leaving. Judy worked as a personal injury lawyer, which she attempted to explain to me with little success. Instead, I taunted her about the possible expense of her cooperation. In response, she merely pressed another kiss against my cheek, leaving me with more doubts than answers. My daughter Alice called me three days later. She informed me that Candy had contacted her, trying to find me. Candy appeared to be in the middle of a working problem and needed to meet with me right away. Alice, on the other hand, kept my whereabouts a secret. I couldn't help but wonder if Oscar had received the valve stems. I immediately called Judy and told her I would pick her up in 20 minutes. Her workplace was located in an upmarket strip mall. Not overly flashy, but certainly tasteful. Judy had never seen the Challenger before. The subject of my car ownership has never came up in conversation. The engine rumbled as she stepped out of her office, drawing curious eyes from her co-workers. I smiled at her as she approached the automobile, and we exchanged amused looks at the attention. So, plate, Michael, what plate? Judy chuckled as she sat in the passenger seat. Maybe you'll want an engagement ring next, I teased as we drove away from the curb. Let's not rush things, she responded with a grin. I kept a steady pace until we passed the Tennessee River, at which point I decided to relax a little. Ronnie, 72, leading into Huntsville, provides a lovely drive, although not perfect for demonstrating the Challenger's ability. Within two hours, we were seated at Dreamland, ready to eat a full lunch. Michael, everyone who attended the launch that night was issued with legal documents today. What do you mean by served? It is a lawsuit. Technically, it is classified as malevolent activity that contributes to the breakdown of a marriage. Is that a real thing? It appears so. They have met all of the criteria. Their actions were planned, harsh, and caused you significant mental distress. Perhaps this is why my wife appeared upset by then. Our plates were heaped with excellent ribs from Dreamland, and the discussion dwindled. Judy finished her final rib and looked up. Why was your wife so upset? My daughter Alice called earlier. Candy urgently needed to meet with me about a job issue she was having. I'm not sure of the details. Oscar Griffin and Gilbert Industries are being sued for a million dollars. The others face $100,000 lawsuits each. I hate to sound negative, but do you think that will actually happen? It may not be straightforward. I have a sense that some interesting developments will occur. I had another lengthy neck, but I resisted because of the drive home. Judy, on the other hand, enjoyed her linger, appreciating the moment and feeling a little adventurous as we left the restaurant. I casually asked Judy if she would want to stay the night and return in the morning. I wish I could, but I cannot. She replied, We may leave earlier, I recommended. That is not the issue. Let's go back immediately. I'll update you along the way. The first 20 minutes of the drive were silent, but then Judy started sharing. Eight years ago, she weighed close to pound 300 and chose diet and exercise over bypass surgery. Surprisingly, she claimed pound 140, but was left with pound 20 in loose skin. It required five procedures to remove it, leaving her with numerous scars throughout her body. Despite being a powerful and vocal lady, she admits to being self-conscious about her scars and avoiding dating and mail services. For some strange reason, she felt comfortable with me. She couldn't figure out why I dropped her off at her house, 
escorted her to the door and laid a tiny kiss on her cheek. She thanked me for the supper, a tear forming in her eye as I departed. Our platonic relationship persisted and we both seemed satisfied with it. Nick and Jack markets were booming, having expanded to two new locations in two years and looking for more. When they offered me a full-time role as inventory manager across all three locations, I accepted, despite the fact that I'd become a regular hire, which required me to go completely legal. At that moment, legality didn't seem to matter much, and Judy seemed pleased, which made me happy. After several weeks of not hearing from my daughters, I received a small text message on my phone. Mom got fired. That complicated the matter. Now that I had a regular job with a reasonable paycheck and Candy was no longer working, I was concerned about getting the short end of the stick in a divorce. But then things got worse. Michael, I've got some positive news about change, Judy replied in a serious tone, gaining my complete attention. What is it? I asked enthusiastically. Three of the eleven persons we sued have settled, she said. What does this mean for us, I inquired. Because we were seeking only one hundred thousand dollars in damages. Their insurance companies urged them to settle rather than face public litigation. Judy stressed that it is covered by their insurance, so they would not suffer a large personal loss. So does this mean we might receive any money out of this? I asked. Hopeful. Yes, Michael, I've already gotten three checks, and there may be more to come. Judy confirmed. Do you think this had anything to do with Candy's firing? I pondered. Judy said, I'm fairly certain it did. How will this influence my divorce proceedings? I questioned. Have you filed yet? Did she write? No, not yet. I was going to ask you for help with it. Judy's face burst out in a big smile as I admitted this. Michael, pack a modest bag and prepare for the challenge. We're taking a vacation to see your wife. We will leave early Thursday morning. I couldn't help but smile, too. We left at 6 a.m. and checked at the Sheraton ten hours later. Is the challenger home? Contentedly. I called Alice and arranged for Candy and Patty to join us for lunch at the Reading Motor the following day. The vibe at supper was a little off. We indulged in items from the Red Lobster menu, probably a little too much, but thinking of it as a festive occasion. Our chat wandered through several themes. Both of us were carefully avoiding the elephant in the room. This was our first night together after more than a year of friendship without benefits. The last thing I wanted was to make Judy uncomfortable. I'll save you the intricate specifics of the evening. I can confirm that it wasn't quite as intimidating as we had anticipated. Both of us felt rusty, but we got through it with the intended results. Judy seemed relieved that I didn't find her offensive, and I was glad it wasn't as awkward as she had expected. We were two happy fools sharing a late breakfast together the next morning, and when we came at the table, Candy and the girls were already there. I was wearing one of my new sports coats, combined with a dark turtleneck. I'm feeling quite keen. Judy chose a lighter business suit to create a casual yet professional image. My wife's and daughter's expressions of shock were unmistakable. Candy, Alice, Patty, meet Judy Walker, my attorney, and I confidently introduced myself feeling the weight of the issue before making any light conversation. The waiter approached and took drink orders. I am not hungry. Just coffee, please. Candy spoke first, establishing the tone for the rest of us. I will have the same. I agreed after a quick check of the table verified the majority conclusion. It's nice to see you again, Mike, to update us on what you've been doing. Candy's words had a tinge of cynicism, and Judy nudged me beneath the table. I responded, just working, giving you the space you needed, with Judy's support clear. Candy replied, You abandoned me when I needed you. You needed someone, but that wasn't me, I countered. Mom and Dad, that's enough. Why are we here? Alice interfered firmly. I realized the meeting wouldn't last long. Feeling disoriented, I glanced to Judy for direction, but she stayed mute, assuming command of the conversation. Judy slipped into her purse and handed Candy an envelope. Dear Mrs. Johnson, this is a divorce petition. It is fair. I recommend that you have your attorney review it, she replied gently, beginning the next step in this tough process. Patty and Alice exchanged stunned looks, apparently taken aback by the unexpected turn of events, but she wore a smug look on her face, instead of accepting the mail from Judy. She took a similar one from her handbag beneath the table. You fool! I divorced your sad behind eight months ago due to desertion. 
Candy spat out her grin, which turned into a smirk. You never received a copy since I didn't know where to send it. It is final. Whatever you have here is worthless. And believe me, there is nothing you have that I want. The server arrived with our coffee and an urn just as Candy stood up, smiling at Judy and me and giving the girls a strange expression. She left the two envelopes on the table. Dad, can we stay for lunch? I've heard that they have. Great quickness here, Patty offered, ending the uneasy pause. Judy and I chuckled in agreement as we asked the server for menus over lunch. Judy. Patty and Alice had a lively talk. While I felt as if I was dining alone, ladies had always been a mystery to me. Before long, the girls swapped phone numbers and promised to keep in touch. Back at the motel, I started packing. Michael. I assumed we were staying another night. Judy commented. We are, but not here. Hurry and pack, I responded. After an hour and a half, we arrived in Maryland. Judy Walker changed her name to Judy Johnson around 30 minutes later. We stayed the night in Luray, Virginia. I wanted to continue driving, but we didn't make it. We located a home with a three-car garage. But that is a story for another day. The girls then informed me that Candy had a meltdown. After realizing that I had won $2 million from Gilbert Industries, she ended up relocating to Iowa. Thank you for spending the time to hear today's story. If you enjoyed this essay, please like it and subscribe if you haven't already. If you have a tale to share regarding your or someone else's circumstance, please do not hesitate to contact me. Take care.